Amen and amen. Amen. Children, you may be dismissed at this time. Children, you can go to Kids Church. And all the moms say, thank God for Kids Church. Praise God for Kids Church. Give me just 40 minutes over here by myself. Amen, amen. My gosh, that's a lot of children. That's a lot of children. Praise God, praise God. God, Jeremy, do me a favor, get me a bottle of water right there. God is good, church, amen? Amen, amen. amen. We have, let me ask you a question. Who is the, uh, I shouldn't say this, who has the most kids in this room? Who's the mom with the most children? How many do you have? How many, how many? Four? Four? Do I have a five somewhere? I got a five. Oh, I got a five over here. Any, anybody with a six around in the, in the room? Anybody? Six? We got how many? Nine. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We got to pray double for him. We got to pray double for them. When you got to go to another hand, you know, we got, we got some problems. You know what I mean? We got issues. All right, I'm asking you, who is the newest mom? I know I see a lot of babies running around here. Who is the newest mom? I'm in the back. Tell me, who's the newest mom? Dewey, when was your baby born? March 6th. Any new baby besides March 6th? Where, where? Giancarlo, what? Tell me. March 2nd. 2nd? We got a bunch of March babies. Well, ha who? An another? When? Give me the date. Yell the date out. March, well, everybody's born in March. We got to do some backtracking. What month was that that everything was happening? I mean, we out of the lockdown, I hate to tell you. I don't know. If, maybe the word got back to them a little late, but we out of the lockdown. All these March babies, holy smoke. But happy Mother's Day to the new moms. I got some new moms in the back. Happy Mother's, first Mother's Day. We celebrate you today. It's been an awesome, awesome time. I, I, I pray and I hope that all of you feel celebrated today. Uh, thank you, everyone, that sent a photo. I'm sorry if we couldn't get your photo up here. Um, it, was just, it was just good to see some of those faces on the screen. It was a real blessing, a real blessing. Yesterday we had a beautiful day. A, a beautiful thing happened here at the church. Uh, you know Tyrell and JoJo, Tyrell and JoJo, they got married yesterday. Oh, man. Tyrell and JoJo, are, they are children of this house. They are amazing. They're away, obviously. So the next time you see them, make sure you hug them extra tight, you know what I mean, and, uh, and love on them. Uh, they're going to come, come back glowing. It was an amazing, beautiful, beautiful time. But uh, love on them. The title of my message today is Mounting Moving Mom. Mounting Moving Mom. And I'm going to read a scripture found in Matthew. Matthew chapter 17, one verse, verse 20. It says, because of your little faith, I truly say unto you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. I want to speak about mount, mountain-moving moms, mountain-moving moms. And I believe that, that you in this room, I, you know, there's something about a mom. I just want to say that, that, that I've said this before, but if I'm ever in a, a, a fight outside or if I'm ever having problems with people, and I'm, I know I'm going to have a fight, I am not going to call the men of the church. Because the toughest people in this church are moms. Come on, how many of you had a mom? I had a Puerto Rican mom that she didn't have to talk after a while. She didn't have to talk. You know, you, you know after a while, sit down, Sam, and Sam, and then she just had to give me the look. And I can get the look from here to the back of this room. And when I saw the look, I better, I, even if I didn't have a chair, I was about to sit down somewhere and just be quiet. My mother had some kind of supernatural strength. She could just give me that look. And it was like those Superman x-ray eyes and boom. Like, oh, my mom was so, I want to call her crazy. She was, she, was, she, was, she was so stern. My friends were afraid of her. You know, like she'd come around the back, all my friends would be like, it's your mom. And they all stand up straight. I'm like, what did my mom do? You know what I mean? But my mom was strict. She was strong. But I will tell you, um, 
now that I'm a dad and I, I watch my wife do what she has to do, I must say, moms, you guys are incredible. I've learned that the role of a mom is like, I don't know if there are enough words to explain what a mom does. You are the manager of the whole family. You know, we all come to you with our problems. I'm sorry as far as, far as husbands that we come to you without, we'll do better, I hope. But those of you that have <coughs> six and seven children, I really feel bad. <laughs> because you hear everyone's problems, you're everyone's counselor, you're everyone's nurse in the house, you're the healthcare provider. Before we call doctors, you know, even as we get older, before we call doctors, we call our mom. Even as adults, mom, there's something wrong. What am I supposed to do? Like, mom has a degree in all this stuff, you know what I mean? Like, huh? The first person we call is mom. Forgive us for this, but you are the primary housekeeper. I'm sorry. <laughs> I try to be neat. The kids try. We do try. But you ever seen that guy in Peanuts that everywhere he went, there was like a cloud of dust went after him? I swear that's me and the children sometimes. And we don't mean to do it, but I'm sorry, Mom, that we do that. You're the, the fashion stylist, thank God. You know, I, I, hmm. when I was growing up, again, my mom, I'm from the old school where you couldn't leave the house with pajamas. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You left the house looking some kind, your mom looking, like, you going outside looking like that? And you thought you looked good. I guess I better go change then, I guess. My mom was the fashionist, fashionista, and, and to this day, those of you that have little ones, you got to dress them. I, I got people that look at me and go, wow, your wife did really good today. What they trying to say? You know what I mean? I looked bad last week. <laughs> Dang. But truthfully, mom is the first teacher. Those first words coming out of the mouth, the mom and, and, and dads were always running around, we're working, and, and some of you are professional moms. I give you double the credit. You guys are amazing. But being, being a, 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 the first teacher, you're the emotional nurturer. You're the activity coordinator. You get older. Some of you that have teenagers become the relationship coach. Everybody comes to you with, Mom, what do I do about this and about that? You're the comforter. And as I was researching this, I said, what is the role of a mom? The one that jumped out at me from secular people was the mom is the primary spiritual guide in the home as well. That's super important. I was doing some research about motherhood, and I found this interesting study that comes out of Scientific America. It's uh, America. It's an online magazine. They actually have a magazine. They did a study. They did a study in the 1950s and 1960s where they took young animals and they separated them from their mom. And they were actually cruel to the animals because they actually isolated them and actually didn't give them a lot of food either. So these, they, they didn't have their moms, they didn't have food around them, and they wanted to see. So, so what they did was, after they separated the animals, then they set up two, two booths. They set up one booth that had full of food. So again, they were isolated, they were hungry. They set up one, one room that had full of food so they, can, they knew they were going to come out hungry. And they set up, so go, let's see if they go. They figured their animal instincts would kick in and they go right to the food. But in the next room, they put the animal's mom. And they said, let's see what the animals do. And they were surprised because, like I said, they thought that uh, the emotions of the animal, the animal instincts of the animal, the, that fact that their, their belly was run, r r tumbling and they were, they were really hungry, that these little animals would run to that food and, and forsake their families and their mothers. But the scientists were surprised because although the, the animals were very hungry, they saw and they smelled the food, they did run. They ate very, very little. They just got a little bit of food on their, on their tongues. But they looked at the food, and they ran to their mothers. And they spent the next 17 to 18 hours snuggling with their mother for the warmth of the touch. The infant animals would sometimes come close, very, very close to starvation before they would even hint of wanting food again. The scientist at that time, he attributed this to something called attachment theory, and he determined that, that the attachment to paternal figures, and particularly, he argued, mothers, played a huge critical role in a child's ability to learn, grow, develop healthy, uh, uh, even adult relationships. But without a strong relationship to mom, the children were destined to never mature properly, mentally, or emotionally. It was in the, in the 1950s. 
So mom, I want to, and and if you're a mom, a new mom, an old mom, if you're a woman in this room, even if you're a man, let me hear you, but I'm going to speak to some things. I hope you hear me, but let me speak to moms. Moms, if you haven't heard it in a while, you are a really big deal. Hmm. Moms, you are, let me say it again. Moms, you are a really big deal. A really, and forgive us that we don't, one day a year is not enough to celebrate you. We should celebrate you a little more. But I want you to know, mom, whether you're a mom, a, 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 a housewife, whether you're a single mom, whether you're a spiritual mom, whether you're a grandparent, whether you're a great-grandparent, whether you're a forced mom, I hope you understand that you are super important and what you do matters. There are children Without you, they would not make it. And I'm a dad, and I would think that I would do an amazing job. But I'm going to tell you, watching what my wife does, I will not be able to raise my children without my wife. Let's not be super prideful here like, guys, we got this. I want to say I got this, but I don't got this. You know how I know? Because during COVID, I stayed home one day. (laughs) That's when they were doing school at home, and I said, babe, I got you today. I'm going to help you today. I got this. And I was ready. 8 o'clock in the morning at that computer screen. Let's get this, let's get this going. And then I started to watch one window open and one window open and two windows open, and I'm ready to get it. But there were some parents that were not ready to get it. So I was waiting. Like, why aren't they ready? What's the problem? And then they would come on. And then, and then you'd hear chaos in the background. And I'm like, but I've been ready since 8 o'clock. And then, and then some, I didn't get the homework. I'm saying, Lord, I can't do this. It's 8.30. I'm like, I can't. I don't know how. My wife's like, I do this every day. I said, I start to look for things to do in the house. I think uh, the lawn needs to be cut. Uh, does this wall need to be painted? I start to look. I said, this is crazy. Half hour, I couldn't, and it's true. You can ask my wife. I could not survive a half hour during that Zoom schooling stuff. But my wife handled that thing every day. I'm like, how did you do that? I couldn't raise my children without my wife. And so moms, I want you to know you are invaluable. There is no one to replace you. I hope you hear me today. Mounting, moving mom. I want to talk to you about a few moms in the scriptures, and I want to hope that this, that this says something today. The first mounting, moving mom, I want to talk about a, a mom of faith. 2 Timothy 1, 3, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 through 7 says something really important. It says, Paul writing to his spiritual son, Timothy, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. And I remember your tears, and I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. But watch what Paul says here, really important. I am reminded of your sincere faith, Timothy. But this is what he says. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure it dwells in you. For this reason, I remind you to fan the flame of the gift of God, which is, which is in you through the laying of my hand. Paul is saying, I- I'm reminded of your faith. I love your faith. But, but what I understand more importantly is the faith that you have wasn't only your faith. Your grandmother and your mom gave that to you. Hmm. Church, what are we passing down to our children today? Let's keep it 100. I'm gonna, church, I love you. You know I love you. Let's not get into this thing. I know it's Mother's Day. I don't, Pastor Mary told me to be nice and not be rough, so I'm gonna try to be on time. Taryn, you gotta tell me if I go over 40 minutes because everybody's gotta go to dinner with their moms. I'm not trying to get anybody mad at me on Mother's Day, but, but you gotta let me just talk a little bit, right? Because the truth is, I love what this says. It's such a key to us as parents and to you as moms, right? That Paul can look at the spiritual man. This is, Timothy was the one that was gonna take over for Paul. Paul was gonna die. He's writing this, he's in prison. He's like, Timothy, Timothy, you're the one that's gotta take over the work. But here it is, I, I, I wanna talk to you a little bit, but, but before I get to that, I'm reminded how you became to be this mighty man of God. It became because your grandmother was, was a woman of faith. And your mom was a woman of faith. So it's not, see, we, oh, it just popped up and Timothy became this mighty man of God. No, there were people that were doing things before he was even born. There was a generation that cared so much that, 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 that they, were, they were in the things of God. Church, I got I to gotta ask you, what are we passing down to our children this morning? Let's be one hundred. Let's keep it. Let's, let's, let's keep it together. You. Let's be, we're family, right? When we're sitting there in front of the boob tube and the news is coming and we're listening to all the stuff that's coming, does fear well up? Can your children see the fear in you? 
Can they see the doubt? Can they see the, 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 the anxiety? And it happens, and I get it. But what I want to get through to you is, is back then, they didn't have what we have, but, but, but they were slaves, basically. The Romans had control over these people. They weren't their own people. So, so, so Timothy had to watch his grandmother and his mom navigate the times of their day the same way we have to navigate the times of our day. But I love that Timothy saw something in his grandmother and his mother. I, again, I'm a father, grandfather, don't get me wrong, but it's incredible that it speaks to his grandmother and his mom. It doesn't speak about his dad or his grandpa. I don't know if they realized it at that time. I don't know if Lois and Eunice understood what they were doing, but they were raising someone mighty that would be used mighty in the kingdom of God. Moms, I speak to you today. I want you to understand that, that the people that you're raising are not just people that just came to be by some random chance. God gave you those children as a gift. The question is, what are we going to do with those children? I've come to realize that those babies, and I want to hoard over them and love over them, but when I look at them, the more I look at them, the more I observe them, I understand that God has given me those two amazing girls, and my job is to raise them up in the things of the Lord. Not to raise them up in the world, or the world according to Disney or Barbie, but the Lord gave them to me, because what my daughters are not called to be, to be lazy and worldly and all stuck in, they're called to be mighty, my little girls. Prayer warriors. I love, you know, and I'm not trying to brag. I've seen it in, in, in Taryn and Pastor Rainey's kids, and I'm sure it happens. But my kids emulate me and my wife. They, they model. It, it's funny. You don't see it until you see it, and then it blows your mind. I have caught my children playing church. They play church, and one of them gets up on an ottoman that I have and starts preaching. I go, huh. And I, when, I, when that hit me, understanding him, that they're watching. Guys, they don't even spend a lot of time in the sanctuary to know that, but they've seen me enough to be like, that's what my daddy does. So now I understand that everything that I do has to have purpose because if I want them to be mighty, then guess what? I have to be mighty. That if I, I can't ask my kids to be something that I'm not. See, sometimes we put things on our children that we're not willing to do ourselves. How come my child doesn't take their Bible to church? How come my Bible doesn't, my child doesn't pray? How come my Bible doesn't act right? They don't care. Well, I got to look at us as parents and say, well, what are we doing? Are we making church a priority? Do we make worship a priority? What do you listen to when you're in the car? Don't ask, don't ask, you know, how come my kids are loving the secular stuff and all like that if we listen to secular stuff? They ask our kids, why do our kids curse? But we, we, we let them watch Netflix while we, they sit down with us. I love you, church. But I believe, and I, again, this is what the man that was going to take over. I want to believe that we are raising giant slayers in this generation. That your children are made to be mighty and strong. Your children are made to do mighty works, greater works than we do. Can we say that to our children? I want to see you do better things than I do. I hope my daughters are better than me. I hope my daughters are greater. I hope they do more for the kingdom than I ever do. I pray that they take this gospel to the ends of the earth. Let them be better. I don't want them to, I don't want them to be a measure. I want them to be greater. You know, Elijah, Elisha, I, will, I know it may be a hard thing, but I pray that they become Elisha. I don't want them to be a, a mini-me. No, be greater than me. I want to I stand in your shadow one day, my daughter. <laughs> but you can only raise up who you are. And so if I know something about Timothy, if I know he became a mighty man of God, then that means Eunice and his mother, Lois, they were mighty in the things of God. Listen to me, I want you to hear something, and maybe some of you don't understand this, but we serve an intergenerational God. Let me explain to you what that means. Exodus chapter two, the Bible says like this, and this, the hints are very early. Exodus chapter 2, starting verse 23. This is for everybody in the room. Man, woman, single person, just married, no, no kids. Listen to me. During, the, during those times, the king of Egypt died. This is after Joseph died. This is the people are in bondage. The people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their, their cry came, their cry, their cry for rescue came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and this is what God said. And God remembered his covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
He didn't remember the covenant of the person that was right before him. He remembered the covenant he made with their fathers and their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers and their great-great-grandfathers. And God said, I, I don't, not, they're going through some stuff, but I remember what I said to that man's grandfather. And because I said it to him, I got to move over here. <laughs> Church, you don't understand that. You don't understand that. That you're doing things right now. Moms, you're doing things right now. Grandma, you're doing things right now that ain't even about you. I mean to tell you that as you walk with God, your grandkids are going to be impacted by your walk with God. Your great-great-grandchildren are going to be impacted by when you walk with God. God is not interested in just touching you. He's interested in your children and your children's children. and your, He's looking to do something lineal you don't understand. Hmm. Exodus chapter C, look what, look, and then, and then he, and then God, God is still up in heaven seeing what's happening. He gets a man that's on the side of a mountain, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 3. And then God said to Moses, don't come near, take your sandals off your feet. The place of where you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of, not you, because you ain't nobody, Moses, right now, but I'm the God of your father. I'm the God of your grandfather. And I'm the God of, I don't think, come on, church, you don't understand what I'm saying. He went to the fifth generation to be like, I got a covenant with that guy over there. Moms, what you do is important. What you do will bring freedom to generations of people that have yet to even be born. Church, I don't know about you, but let's talk about it a little bit. If y'all want to be all, don't want to talk about it, let's talk about it. Some of us have come from some junk. Alcoholism, drug abuse, womanizing. Some of us come from families that are stuck in divorce and all this kind of brokenness. Some of us in this room, and I stand here as one, that did not know when I was growing up what a peaceful, nice-looking little home looked like with the picket fence and the car in the garage. I didn't know that. I grew up in the hood where my mom and my dad were divorced before I even knew it. So the seeds of, of discord were sown into my spirit before I even knew what I was doing. I didn't know what married people looked like. I came, from, I came from, from divorce. I didn't know. My dad was an alcohol and drug abuse my whole life. I had no idea. I had no idea what health looked like. You know what I mean? And that was coming down generation to generation. My grandmother had a, had a problem with divorce. She separated from my, my grandpa. So I had some stuff going on in my family. But when the Lord saved me, church... He didn't save me and say, well, it's all good that you're saved and you can do your little hunky-dory little church thing here. I need to change some things in, your, in the lineage of your family. I didn't save you just for you, just so you could do church, just so you could do a little pastoral thing. I saved you because I'm going I'm to change the destiny, your destiny, the destiny of your children, the destiny of your grandchildren. I'm going to change the whole thing, Sam. I thank God so much that I didn't get married when I first got saved. When I first got saved, God had to clean me out. He got me in. Ten years I was saved before I even met my wife. I thank the Lord. Because in that time, he was like, we need to get over some of these weeds that are in here. We need to get some of this dysfunction out of here. We need to get you to understand that you're not going to do what your daddy did. I've made covenants with God. Again, I grew up alcohol, drug abuse, and the covenant I made with God in my house, there will never be liquor. Never. There will not be a drip of beer. When I, had, when I got married, people looked at me, secular people, like, well, you got no liquor here? No, no liquor here. Set the tone right from the jump off. We're not doing this here. My daughters will never see alcohol in my house. They will never see drugs in my house. We will never mention the word divorce in my house. Never. I set the tone. Because again, God, did, he's the God of generations. And I don't know about you, but some of us in this room need to start putting our foot down. And again, I love y'all, right? So you know if you're housewives or you're a single mom or whatever, you're a foster mom, spiritual mom, I don't care where you find yourself. You have the power in you to put your foot down today and say, devil, this is where it's going to end right here. This Mother's Day is the end of all of that dysfunction. See, I serve a God. I don't know about you, but I serve a God that when I started walking with him, he didn't let me stay the person I used to be. He dictated some things in my life. He said, hey, there are some problems in your heart that we're going to deal with. 
There's some stinking thinking that we're going to have to deal with. So we're going to, see, I know anyone that has an honest walk with God is going to change. If you come to church and you say, well, pastor, I've been coming to church for all these years and I got these same problems, and that's some telling me something's going on here. Because the God that I know, the Holy Spirit that I know, puts his finger on a lot of things in my life. I don't know about you, but I feel like I live a life of discomfort. Because he's always working on me. He's always working on me. He's always working on me. But I understand it now. It's clear. It's not about me. It's about my daughters. It's about my daughter's children. I don't want my daughter. Listen, they say that our daughters will marry men that resemble their daddy. So I hope that when a dude comes to my door, hmm, I can't wait. I'm going to have some fun with that dude. It's going to be a problem. But, but you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is, I'm going to know a lot about that dude, even if he comes to talk to me before he touches my daughter, because he's going to know we don't do that here. I'm not going to take my daughter and date her all over the world, whatever. You can come to my house. <laughs> Why y'all laughing? <laughs> no, but I pray that my daughter finds a man that is in love with Jesus more than he's in love with her. And that man better come to my house and he better prove to me, you're going to show me you love the Lord. You're going to show me. It's not about finances or money or whatever. It's do you love Jesus. You're going to... It's not about me. It's not about you. He is the God of the generations. The faith of this mother and this grandmother dictated to this young man who he was going to be. And that young man became powerful in the hands of God. And it was all because of mom and his grandma. I'm going to challenge you today to speak life over your children. Let them see you serving the Lord. Let them see you speaking about the Lord. Let them see you read your Bible. Let them see you pray. Lay your hands on those children. Let your children see you live a life of purity. I'm not getting a lot of amens, but it's okay. I'll amen myself. High five myself. Let me say it again. Let your children see you live a life of purity. I, was, I myself personally was watching a movie the other day. Don't judge me. It's a Disney movie. I watched it by myself. Because you want to know why? <laughs> Don't judge me. You know, I, I screen everything my daughters see. Don't judge me. And I put on this movie. I like Toy Story. Y'all like Toy Story? Buzz is my guy. But people say I look like Woody because I'm skinny and all that. But I ain't going to get into it. <laughs> like, I don't want to be. I want to be Buzz. Buzz is the cool one. But I watched that movie Buzz Lightyear. I said, because I like Buzz. I want to see what the hubbub was about. And you know, they introduced two moms in that movie. And you're like, this is a movie for kids, man. See, I love you, church. We can't be complicit in putting things before our children than asking why they went wrong later. I'm not ready to have certain conversations with my daughters. My daughters are so, like, they're so innocent still. They're so pure still. I'm trying to hold on to that as long as I can. I know some, at some moment the bubble's going to burst. But I'm not trying to put things in, like, because it, it starts to condition you is what happens. They put little things in there with cartoons, right? They put little things in there with, with and they start to condition you so you think it's no big deal. Then the conversation becomes really hard to have later and tell them what's right and wrong. But daddy, Disney did it. But daddy, that person wound up being a hero. That person went, but babe, but it's wrong. So we can't sit there and allow our children to go down these roads and, and then be like, but, but let's go to church and talk about, because then they're going to be like, no, I don't want to. Why? Because they've been conditioned to be, to, to be I'm going to be honest with you, they conditioned with an atheistic spirit. Let's not get into that. That's mom number one, the, a mom of faith. Let me talk to you about a mom of promise, a, another mountain moving mom. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 11, thir verse 30, talks about a woman by the name of Sarai. And the Bible tells us that in Genesis 11.30 that Sarai was barren and she had no child. And here's the problem. Here's the, I'm going to give you some, back, some background. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 15, I, I believe it will be on your screen. 
After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord, how, what will you give me? For I am childless in the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, I have, I, behold, you have given me no offspring. And remember, my house will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside. God said to him, Look toward the heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and it was counted for him for righteousness. Now watch this next, this next chapter, Genesis 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. Church, the man did not have a baby, and he was 99 years old. Every man in here, if the Lord told you when you were old, and you were like, let's not even go to 99. Let's say 80 years old and say, guess what? I'm about to give you a son. All of us would be like, to who? <laughs> give who a son? Must be, I, you know, let's be honest. The Ebonics version of this would be like, who are you talking to, Lord? You must be bugging. That's what I would have said. You must be having me mistaken for another. There's another Abraham walking around this desert or something. But the Bible says Abram was 99 years old and the Lord still had given him no offspring. Nothing. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's a long time to wait for a promise. That's a long time to wait for God to do something in your life. Moms, listen to me very carefully. Sometimes God has us in wait mode. There are times when you pray. There are times when, you, when God promises you some things and you're sitting there waiting. And I don't know about you, and this is in the 90s, but there have been times when my patience starts to lack because I'm like, God, where are you in this? To my moms that are in this crowd, to my parents that are in this crowd that have children that are, that are out there doing some crazy stuff, I know you've prayed over and over and over, and I know the thing that comes up is, God, where are you? Come on, if you've walked with God for a long time, you've asked that question once in a while. God, where are you? God, what is going on? Verse 15 says, and God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you won't call her Sarah, you call her Sarah, shall be her name. I will bless her. Moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall, she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come to her. Then Abraham fell, Abraham fell on his face and laughed because he said, shall a man, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old and Sarah, a wife who's 45? She was 92. So they laughed. It's just impossible. But God said, I have something coming out of you that's going to be really special. I have something going on in you that's really special. God promised her a son. God promised her something super incredible, something that was going to be mighty, something that was going to carry on that lineage. And they laughed. But I'm here to tell you that my God is a God that keeps his promises still. I don't know about you, but I believe God has said some things to people in this room. God has promised some things to you. And I want to tell you that God has not forgotten the things that he's spoken over you. Some of you are waiting for your, your health to come back online. God has not forgotten you. Some of you think that you've come to the end of your rope financially. I'm here to tell you, God has not forgotten you. Some of you have come, to, my, my child is out there. It's getting worse. You don't understand, Pastor. It's getting worse and it's getting worse. My child is getting worse. I'm here to tell you, God has not forgotten you. Your child is not too far for God. Your situation is not too far for God. You're battling in your mind, I'm never going to be free of this situation. I'm never going to be free of this sinful thing. I'm never going to be free of my bondage. I'm here to tell you, God has not forgotten you. The Bible says his promises are yea and amen. Let me read some promises to you. The book in Ephesians says it like this. For this reason, I bow my knee before heaven, uh, before my Father in heaven, uh, in, in the earth is, I'm sorry, according to his riches and glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit on the inner being. If you're weak today, accept that. God said he's going to strengthen you. <laughs> Bible says that God promises to give you rest and Jesus said come to me all you who are heavy weary and heavy carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest take my yoke from me let me teach you because I am humble and gentle and I and there you will find rest for your soul 
You're in this room and you're battling and you're heavy. I'm here to tell you, God gives you rest. You're emotional. You're going through some things. You've been hurt. You've been beaten. You've been bad. I'm here to tell you, God is still with you. The Bible says that God promises to take care of all of your needs. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which we have been given in Christ Jesus. Well, y'all quiet today. It's okay. <laughs> Psalm 37 says it like this. I have been young and now I am old, and yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. Amen. Thinking your finances are run out, God still got you. <laughs> God promises. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to church. He will answer your prayers. He will answer your prayers. Don't you stop praying. Don't you stop seeking the face of God. The Bible says in Romans, we know that, all, that God causes everything to work together for the, for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things will work out for you. Jesus says, I will, God says, I will not fail you nor abandon you. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Romans says, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate you from the love of God. And on top of all of that, God promises you everlasting life. When this life is over and when this life, when we give our last breath, Jesus says, for God loved you so much that he demonstrated his love that he gave his only son for you and for me, that we should not perish but have eternal life. Come on. Church, there are over 3,000 promises in Scripture. I challenge you to take hold of a few of them. Know a few of them. It would transform your life if you, have, if you have an idea of what God says about you. It will transform your life when you find out what God says about you. How about this for our, my parents in the room? This is a promise. You take this to the bank. Train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they get old, they will not depart from it. <laughs> Come on, church. I don't understand. He said, train up the child in the way they should go, and when they get old, the word, what you teach them will keep them. What you teach them will hold them. What you teach them will make sure they don't get off the path. When they will come home based on what you teach them. Yes. Lamentation says it like this, a steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let us never forget the faithfulness of God. The Lord is my portion, therefore will I hope in him. I talked to you about a mom with faith. I'm I talked to you about a mom of a promise that holds on to the promise. I also want to talk to you about a mom of desperation. You know, a lot of us talk about revival and coming to church and wanting stuff from church, but the truth of the matter is, I am convinced we're not desperate enough for what God wants to do. We come to church and we want to do a nice little religious thing, but I'm here to tell you, the church needs to become a little, more, a little bit more desperate for a touch of God. You can believe me, you can not believe me, I just see it myself. We're content with doing Sunday morning, a lot of us, a lot of people. We're not desperate enough. But you know when we, come, we become desperate? We become desperate when we get to the really end of our rope. I think, I, I haven't heard this said often, or I don't know where it came from, but I really think that we really, learn, really start to learn about who God is when we come to the end of ourselves. When we stop striving, when we stop doing, when we stop trying to figure things out in our own strength, when we finally give up. Have you ever come to a place where you just give up? Nobody, it's just me. 
There have been times when I come to the end and I've, I've fought for so long. I've, I've battled in myself for so long. I've tried to fix my problems. I've tried to fix the issues of my heart. And I come maybe one day to, and really it doesn't even happen on Sunday service, if I can be honest with you. It happens when I'm alone. It happens in moments of prayer. When I stop and I say, God, I'm done trying to figure this out. I really need you this time. I really need you. See, because we come to church, we read a little Bible, and we think that we read a little Bible so we, we can apply Scripture to our problems, and we leave out the God of the Scripture. And we just quote, we quote the Bible to ourselves so, like a, like a, so it could be like a motivational thing. You know, we can make Christianity, uh, we can make Jesus a real good motivational speaker. We can make him a good uh, uh, philosopher or a good theologian. He could give us a lot of good ideas. We can get a lot of good ideas out of the scriptures and out of the Bible. But the problem is, are we really applying what he's talking to us about? Are we really saying, God, speak to me? And I think there comes a moment where you stop reading the Bible just to do your devo and just to get through the Bible in a year. And you come to the, I don't know, I'm going to speak for myself. I don't know about you. You can judge me later if you want. But there are times I've come to my word and I say, God, you're going to have to speak to me today. I'm tired and I'm weary and I don't have answers and I've read this thing cover to cover, but Lord, I need a word right now. There are times where you won't have time to call your pastor. There will be times you won't have time to call your intercessory buddy or your mom even. There are times where you're going to come to the end of it all and you're going to say, God, I need a word from you you're the only hope for my soul in this situation. You're the only one I can come to. See, there's got to come a moment, church. I, I got to tell you, there's got to come a Forget about church and Christianity and religion. I'm talking about desperation. I'm going to speak lovingly to you, but there's no statue that you can be desperate about that's going to answer you. There's no God that... Uh, Forgive me, but Allah can't do it, and, and, and Krishna can't, and, 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 and these, these philosophies, and, and the Buddhists, and you can't go to Buddha with desperation. You can go there, but what you're really talking to is a dead statue. But when, what I'm talking about is a desperation coming to the living God, coming to his feet, and saying, God, I really need you. Like, if you don't come through, I'm done. We've raised a whole generation to do church, and they've never interacted with the Holy One. They've come to church to get a word from a pastor, but they've never heard from God for themselves, and that breaks my heart. But there's a mom in the scriptures, and I want to read it for you. This woman was desperate. Desperate. And I'll, 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 let's go through the desperation. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 says, Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman, another version says, the Syrophoenician woman, from the region came out and was crying, have mercy on me. Oh, Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Now, moms and dads in this room, you know what kind of desperation she must be talking about. Because I don't know about you, but you could do anything to my body. You touch my daughter's body, my whole, everything changes inside of me. Come on, you, you know, oh, come on, old people. We don't like going to doctors and what and what not. Me and my house, if something happens to my daughter, I got to get her well. I have to get her whole. I don't care. My daughter, when she was a baby, she used to sniffle in the crib, and I used to run to the crib. Whatever I got to do for that little girl, I'm going to do for that little girl. And this mom comes to Jesus. Have mercy, my. Could you imagine your daughter, your son being oppressed by a demon? There are versions, other stories where the Bible tells us that, that, that people would bring their children to the disciples and they couldn't do anything. But they were so desperate that then if you can't do anything, then just get out of the way and show me the person that can give my daughter this healing. I need help, somebody. The Bible says, have mercy on me, Lord. Son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon, but he did not answer her word. And the disciples came to him begging, send her away because she's crying after all of us. Tell her to go away. Some people in this room, if I told you to get away, you'd go home. This woman said, no. That's desperation. Oh, the church is closed. Open the church. I need some help. Where's that kind of desperation? But it's raining. I can't come to church. You need help, but you won't come in the rain. Oh, it's too hot in that church. If we say all kinds of excuses not to go to church, then that means you really don't want Jesus to move in your situation. 
Oh, but the football game is on. Okay, so the Jets and Giants, go. I love sports, but let's get, let's get it clear. People pack stadiums. They pay to go to stadiums. Hundreds and thousands of dollars to get, to get their emotions tickled by football, and they're broken. we got to come to a place of desperation. If you really mean business with God, if you really want a touch from Jesus, I hate to tell you a little kumbaya song, he's not going to cut it in these days. Saying a few scriptures and, and quoting a few scriptures to a pastor and thinking, look at this beautiful lip service. You know, they did that and Jesus hated those people. Jesus, this is what they would do. They, they, they'd come outside and they'd come out in their finely dressed linens and they would pray a regal prayer. And the Bible says they did that just to be seen by people. So that people go, oh, look how holy they are. Look how holy they are. Look how beautiful they are. They are the most religious. They must really know God. Jesus looked at them and says, you are like, like whitewashed sepulchers. You are, you are beautiful on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. He looked at them. His own people. Could you imagine that? They had no desperation. They were happy with that life. Church, can I, can, can I implore you, can I encourage you, don't be satisfied with what you know. Don't be satisfied with the Bible that you have in here. Don't be satisfied with your church attendance or how much you tithe. Don't be satisfied with how many ministries you're in. Don't be come to me, well, pastor, I grew up in church. I don't care if you grew up in church. I know a lot of people that grow up in church and go through kids' church and go through youth group and become young adults, and, when they, and they still don't know Jesus. What you did was just take up a seat. You could have done that anywhere. We're not here for you to take, I'm not here for you to just take up a seat. I'm not interested in you coming so I can see you every week so we could hug. I love hugging you. Happy Mother's Day. I love kissing you and all that. But I'm not interested in you coming just to see me. If you came to see me, if you came to say, wow, Pastor, I had a great word today. Pastor Mario was amazing today. Pastor Ren, that was a great word. If you left this building talking about us, we missed it. If you go home talking about, well, the Hope Center, don't brag on the Hope Center. The Hope Center is nothing good in the Hope Center. We're not here to boast in ourselves. We're here to find, really get a hold of the master, of the king of kings. and the Lord. That's why I'm here. I don't know about you, but if you came to do kumbaya and just do church, we missed it. So let me tell you, we're not here to just see each other and have a good time. I came here because I want to hear from the Lord. I came here because I want him to say something to my spirit. I'm here because I give me a word, God. Give me something, God. Let somebody walk up to me with the word. I don't know what it is, but God, I didn't come here just to do church. If you did, then we missed it. I'm here because I'm desperate for a word. God, I need you to move. Why my children are in children's church? God, I'm desperate for you to get a hold of my children. And if you will use that, they're talking about the Holy Spirit today. Lord, get a hold of my children in that room. Let them be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They don't have to be baptized with me in my room. Lord, let, come on, Jesus. I serve and I preach and I give everything that I am to the Lord because I am, I am desperate. God, I'll do whatever I have to do, God. I'll put my family all up in your way if you would just touch them. <laughs> I'll tell you a testimony. I'm not going to cry. I promise. Good Friday, I was not here. I was in Hackettstown. And I was tired, church. I, my schedule is a little weird right now. We're all over the place, my family and I. And I was tired. And they said, Go over there and speak on Good Friday. Sure. But I was tired. And as a pastor, it's difficult when you don't have a word. You don't get a word. I don't have a word. I don't know what to do. So I said, it's Good Friday. What am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about the cross. I'm just going to talk about Jesus the whole time. I don't care. If they mad at me, they never invite me back. I'm talking about Jesus, the cross, the blood. I don't care. And I did. I, it, it was a... And as I preached and, and I, I gave an altar call, I wish I could have the picture on my phone. David was there. I gave an altar call. And uh, adults didn't raise their hands, that altar call. Some young ladies started raising their hand. I was like, man, I'm preaching. I'm just doing my thing. It's all good. And I saw one hand go up that rocked my world. David is my witness. And uh, it was my daughter. My hand went up. I was like, oh, God. It's just a moment. And I just had to stop myself because I was trying to be pastoral, you know. My God, you're going to give me my daughter's salvation. Yes, God. Yes, 
Yes, God. You've been hearing my, you've been hearing my pleading, all the work that I, all the toil that I do, God. I do it just for that one moment. That the Lord would really save my daughter's soul. When I stood there, it was like five little girls, five young girls. And I said, this is the, I said, yes, God been desperate, God, the whole, my, my prayer, delight yourself, you guys know this, delight yourself in the law of the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart, the desires of my heart have nothing to do with money and fame and fortune, you could strip the pastoral thing, Lord, just save my family, he's doing it one by one. <laughs> church that's what it's all. and so this moment of desperate lord you got to have mercy you got to do this for my family for my children can i be honest parents he comes through god comes through i'm living witness when i saw that happen to my life yes god all the toil the hardship the difficulty i go through i'm not home a lot and all these but lord you save them i'll do it for you double time you save my family I'm going to tell you, God is in the business of still saving our children, and he will do it if you are desperate enough to get a hold and hold on to him and forsake the things of this world. Church, let's stop being secular Christians, thinking we could do church worldly stuff, then come to church and God, do this thing for me. God's not looking. He's looking for people that are desperate, truly set apart, saying, God, I, this is what I will do. The Bible says that the disciples begged him, send her away. And this is what Jesus said, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was telling her, I, uh, no, I got to deal with these people first. Again, a little bit of confrontation, a little bit of setback. But this woman, she, she was so desperate, again, that desperation. But she came and knelt before him, got past the disciples. She didn't, oh, she disrespected Jesus, I guess. But she said, she says, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Rough statement. If that were me, I would have been a little offended. How dare you call me a dog? How dare you speak to me like that? I need help. But she didn't get offended. She didn't, get, she didn't worry. She didn't say, no, 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 Lord, you don't understand. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from your table, and I'll take the crumbs right here, right now. Some of us, if the pastor don't pray for you, if the pastor don't personally pray for you, you get offended. This is not about a pastor. This is not about leaders. This is about you. Even the crumbs I will take from your, your throne, Jesus. Even the crumbs. Get everybody out of my way. I'm desperate, oh God, for a touch for you. I'm desperate. My family is desperate. From the master's table. I want to, the fact that she would say that, the fact that she would get close to the master's table. Some of us are afraid, but I'm here to tell you when you're close to the master's table, you'll be surprised the crumbs that you get. Come on. Huh. You can keep the, the seat at the table, I'll sit at the foot of that thing. And Jesus answered her, Oh woman, watch this. Great is your faith. Be it done to you as your desire. Mark says like this, for your statement, because you said that, because of the fact that you came at me so boldly and you knew you, I was the only hope, you may go your way. He says, don't even worry. The demon has left your daughter right now. It's over. Huh. Bible says, and she went home and found the child laying in bed, the demon gone. The mom's actions, her moment her her attitude of desperation her attitude of i have to get what i gotta get jesus is my only hope i'm gonna go and i'm gonna press past everything saved her child her desperation shall i say it again save the generations that were yet to come she understood the power of the master she understood the power of jesus she understood that one whisper from the throne room of God, everything changes. Some of us don't understand whom we're talking to when we pray. Some of us think we're talking to a genie in a bottle or, or, or some old man in the heavens or whatever. You are talking to the one that told the son to stay right there. You are talking to the one, they go, gravity this, gra no, God's the one that said, Neptune, you stay right there. Pluto, you stay right there. Stars, you stay right there. Oh, by the way, my name is Jehovah, and I belong to you too. 
Some of us don't understand. We think we a little God, little things. My God does mighty and big things. He is still in control. He is still, there is, he is the Lord of Lord, the kings of kings, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. There is no one else but him. <laughs> this woman understood there was nobody going to get in the way between her and God. No one. Her desperation. Are you desperate? Church, what, what? our families go through things. I remember when my grandmother, I got a call that my grandmother had a stroke. I'll never forget because that moment, in an instant, I got desperate. She had a stroke. She's not going to make it. At that particular moment, you didn't have to ask me to fast. You didn't have to convince me to fast. You didn't have to convince me to pray. I became desperate in a moment. I say, oh, God, spare her life. The hunger left my body. It was a matter of life and death. God, please move. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You get a call that somebody's in the hospital or somebody had a, a really, really bad accident. You don't need to be told to get desperate in that moment. Then something just switches in you. Oh, my God, I got to get there. I got to do this. You will get desperate. When was the last time we were desperate for the people that we really loved? When was the last time we were desperate for the people that we love that are lost? When was the last time we were desperate for a real move of God in our lives? Jesus went to a cross because we were separate. We were separated. We were far from God. We had no hope. We had nothing. It was just us killing sheep. And, and, and God in his divine mercy said, I'm done with this kind of religion. I'm done with this kind of religion. It's time to change it. And what God, Jesus did on that cross, what God did to his son on that cross was, he put him on that cross and he killed him so that you and I could have access to God Almighty himself. That you don't have to come to a pastor and say, Pastor, pray for me for my health. Pastor, pray for me because I'm going through this thing or that thing. Jesus went to a cross. He said, you know what? It is finished. You can go directly to God now. You can go directly to God Almighty. You can speak to him as Moses spoke to him face to face. Church, I don't think you understand, but you have access to the Holy of Holies in this place today. The question, uh, the question is, are you desperate enough to go in? Are you desperate enough to enter that special place? Are you desperate enough to walk in and say, Father, I am here and I have some things I need to discuss with you. As a father does to a son or a daughter. Hebrews 4.16 says it like this. Therefore, let, let's approach the throne room of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and grace and find help. And now let me go back. Therefore, let's approach the throne room of grace. Think of the picture, picture it in your mind, a throne room of a king sitting there, and there are peasants all over, but the Bible says you have access to walk into the throne room and talk to the Father. Hebrews 10 says it like this, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated through us through the veil, that is, through his flesh, since we have a great priest over the house of God, let's approach God with a sincere and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from evil and our bodies washed with pure water. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, church again if you hear my voice this morning hear me say this I know it's Mother's Day and I'll be done in two minutes Josh can you come this Mother's Day yeah I, I know we're celebrating mothers but if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior if you don't know him listen coming to church is nice but that doesn't mean you know him coming to a church service and hearing me preach doesn't mean that you know him it just means you came to church and you heard me speak, but it doesn't mean you know him. But I'm here to tell you this morning that he invites us into this holy place, this holy space, this, this, this throne. He invites us in. He says, you know what? In this place that I have for you is everything that you need. 
They're in this room and you need healing. And you, maybe your mind, your heart is broken and you need a touch of God. He says, I'm waiting for you. I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for you all along. Maybe you're in this room and you got a broken heart by something that someone did to you or, or some things, whatever. I'm here to tell you that God is waiting, saying, I'm waiting for you. Maybe some of you have come to church and you've, you've worshipped God from the, out, the outer court and the outside. And God's like, I'm waiting for you on the inside. I'm waiting for you. I don't want to yell at you anymore. I don't want to yell at you from afar. There are some things I want to whisper to you in the holy place. Just come close. Come close. And let me touch you. Maybe you think you're in this church today. Say, oh, I'm here because my, my mom asked me to come. I'm here to tell you you're not here because your mom asked you to come. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe in chance. I don't believe in just random things. I believe God wanted you to be here on this day to hear this voice tell you that God loves you. He has not forsaken you. He is not far from you. He is so close to you even now. And he calls to you in your brokenness, in your pain, in your discomfort, in your confusion. He says, I am here waiting for you. I've loved you and you didn't even know it. I've had my eye on you and you haven't been looking at me, but I've been looking at you because I love you. Why? Because you're my daughter and you don't even know it. You're my son. You're out there. You've been running. You've been fighting. You've been fighting your flesh, your sin, the thoughts, and I'm here. I'll help you. I'll give you the peace that you've been looking for. Therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace at the time of our need. This is where I end it right here. I don't know where you find yourself in mom one, mom two, or mom three. Maybe you're a mom or you're a grandma. I'm here to tell you that what you do right now matters. The generations of your family matter. What you do in the next moment matters. For your children, for your grandchildren, for your great-grandchildren. For some of you, you are the Abraham to the story. And God is calling you, it's time to start moving. Maybe for some of you, you're like Sarah, the mom of the promise. Maybe God has promised some things to you. Maybe you're waiting on God for something and God's like, it's time. It's time. It's time to resurrect that promise that's inside of your belly. You should be, Pastor, I'm old. Pastor, I'm too far gone. No, no, no. You may be too old, but the promise of God is alive. And it's ready. And it's still active in your life. It's activating. Maybe it's time for you to get a hold of it. Some of you are called to be preachers and teachers, more eloquent than me. And God's like, that calling inside your life, it's time. It's time. It's time. Maybe some of you are like that nameless mom, the Syrophoenician lady, the Canaanite. You're desperate for a touch from the Lord. You're desperate for a touch. Maybe it's your children that you're holding on to, and it's just you, and you're holding on. God, I need you. I don't know what to do. Maybe you're holding on to your marriage. Maybe you're holding on by a string. I've been there. And you come to a place of desperation. Jesus, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to hold on anymore. I don't know how to hold on to this marriage. I don't know how to hold on to my children. I don't know how to hold on to my faith, God. What do I do? And just like that woman, maybe your flesh is telling you, oh, forget God. God is not going to answer. God is too, it's time to get desperate. And push past that and say, I'm not going to listen to my flesh or my fear. God, I need you in this time, in this moment. I'm desperate for you. Where are you today? If everyone could bow their eyes, bow your head and close your eyes. Bow your head and close your eyes.